Um, but I do want to say that uh, Barbara Kibbe is the best. Uh, she was one of CEP's initial funders back in the day when she was at the Packard Foundation, and that was the funding that led to uh, a staff position being created, and so I'm very grateful because I was hired uh, in, that, in that role. Uh, but she is someone who most of you know. She's currently Director of Organizational Effectiveness at uh, the SD Bechtel uh, Foundation, but uh, she's in many leadership roles in philanthropy over the years, has been a huge uh, advocate and leader for effectiveness in philanthropy. She's going to uh, frame the conversation. Uh, then we're going to hear from Barbara Kellerman. Uh, and then Barbara Kibbe is going to uh, bring in the audience to a discussion with Barbara Kellerman. A lot of Barbara Kays. Uh, and uh, so it's a great pleasure to introduce my colleague and friend, Barbara Kibbe. I promise lively. To get us started, I want to say that um, over the past several decades, the language, the tools, the processes, the practices, in fact, the very profession of philanthropy has evolved steadily and even dramatically. During the 1990s, for those of you who were working in the field then, you may remember, and for those of you who weren't, I can tell you much more about it later. Uh, it was a time of tremendous wealth creation and growth in philanthropy. The concepts of competitive positioning, entrepreneurship, venture capital were ported over from the business sector, along with a large number of highly engaged and energetic living donors who questioned traditional practices in philanthropy. Suddenly then, we were talking about effectiveness. Toward the end of that decade, newly minted philanthropy infrastructure organizations like CEP turned the lens on the, the field of philanthropy itself. Not only did we care about whether our nonprofit grantees were effective, we were starting to ask ourselves whether we were effective. Strategic philanthropy took flight uh, with more, and because of CEP, better data, as well as a drive for focus, niche, brand equity, an impact among a growing number of foundations that self-identified as strategic. <clears throat> More than a decade later, um, <clears throat> philanthropy continues to experience what I would call explosive growth. Uh, around the turn of the millennium, there were about 60,000 foundations. Uh, now there are upwards of 100,000. I am a proponent and a practitioner of strategy and evaluation, especially believe in them when they're used in tandem. And I'm also an optimist. But those circumstances cause me to pause. And about three years ago, I was thinking about where all of this might take us. Uh, there was more than one future I could imagine. But the scenario that troubled me the most was the trend toward unchecked differentiation and brand building in strategic philanthropy. The image this scenario invoked for me was of traffic lights on every corner of every street in Manhattan, each under the control of independent operators that think they alone know how to move traffic. Simple gridlock aside, imagine the unintended social, health, and economic consequences. If you zoom out to the global stage and factor in the important uncertainties and rapid changes related to technology in the internet, education, crime, climate change, aging, health, poverty, peace, and pandemics, to name a few of the wicked problems philanthropy attempts to address, individual leadership seems a sad and anemic response. It also seems to be the only horse we're really betting on in the field. Three years ago, I went looking for a new paradigm. I searched Amazon for books on leadership, and I got 140,000 titles. I searched followership, you know, three dozen. But most of those were actually still about leadership uh, or about managing constituencies. A few seemed to be about how to lead a spiritual life. None of that was quite what I was looking for. But there was a jewel in there. Uh, I discovered Barbara Kellerman. <clears throat> I devoured her book, The End of Leadership, 
and discover the other 12 or 14 she had written by then. And I started telling everyone who would listen about her, her work, including Phil. Fast forward to today, Barbara Kellerman is here with us, having written yet another well-researched and beautifully crafted book that puts individual leadership in its place. We are none of us solo actors. We need to aggregate more than data. We need to get together in the interest of making big changes that matter. Barbara's most recent book, Hard Times, is full of messages for us, and she is here to help us apply them to our world. Barbara? Uh, okay, hi, thank you for having me. Uh, I hope that uh, after this conversation is over, uh, you're still gonna feel uh, welcoming. Um, it's because I am in my field. I am a leadership person. Uh, at least that's how I defined myself earlier on. But what happened to me over the years, and you're going to hear about this in the next, uh, it looks like it's the next 81 minutes, but it's actually the next 30 or so minutes. I'll try to watch my own clock. Uh, is that over the years, I have become, as I said, a contrarian which is that I have taken on almost all of the sacred cows of what I have come to call the leadership industry. Now, is there any, let me just ask, is there anybody here from the Kellogg Foundation? Nobody. Oh yes, oh my God, hi, okay. <laughs> so I am asking because it's quite interesting <laughs> It's quite interesting that what I call the leadership industry actually was started in considerable part by money received from the Kellogg Foundation. <laughs> well, I'm not so sure. We'll, 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 <laughs> that, that remains to be determined. So just, I'm gonna, first of all, I'm gonna talk fast because there's so much that I, I, I wanna have you hear but I, I will start with history, just a word of history, which is that people have been interested in, um, in leadership, as you all know, since the beginning of time. I, in fact, uh, have a, a book out on the really great leadership literature, and I don't mean anything that's been written recently, uh, beginning with Lao Tzu and Plato and Confucius and so forth and so on. And so we know that all the way back, people have been interested in leadership. The leadership industry, though, this stuff that is fixated on leadership, and we all know about the endless amounts of executive programs and seminars and courses and workshops. By the way, at Harvard University, every single graduate school has the word leader or leadership in its mission statement, and I'm including the School of Medicine and the School of Law, needless to say, the School of Education, School of Business, School of Government. I'm thinking, why is it that my attorney needs to be a leader? Why does my physician need to be a leader? Why isn't enough for my physician to be a great physician? Do I give a damn if he or she is also a leader? Be that as it may, the mentality, the mentality now is ennobling of leadership and leader and becoming a leader in ways that is only about 30 or 40 years old, and I'm not kidding when I say that the Kellogg Foundation did give this industry some seed money. It's more complicated than that, but it actually played a fairly in, uh, instrumental role in giving birth to what I call the leadership industry. Now, this uh, PowerPoint slide that you see in front of you explains a fair amount of what I'm talking about when I talk about the industry. This is a capitalist money-making proposition. I include myself in that, although I'm relatively impoverished <laughs> because, and I will explain to you what I do that my colleagues don't do. 99.9% .9 of my colleagues say that what they do, and who am I to say they're wrong, <clears throat> say that what they do is to teach people how to lead. I tell my students and my audiences that if you want to know how to lead, if you want to learn from me how to lead, you're in the wrong room. 
I have no idea how to teach people how to lead. What I do know something about, however, is the subject of leadership. This industry, though, is based on the supposition that you can teach people how to lead. So you can read these very quickly, but you'll see some of my critiques, because among the assumptions, just to take a random example, is that it can be taught quickly and easily. Now, Plato, when he talked about teaching leadership, remember what Plato's leader was called? Anybody? Oh, excuse me. Hello? Yes, say it louder. Philosopher King. Yes, the Philosopher King. The Philosopher King learned over a lifetime. Can you imagine the Philosopher King going to an exec ed program at the Harvard Kennedy School that lasts for a week or two weeks or even three months? People take my courses, they think they're going to end up knowing how to lead. No. Leadership learning is learning over a lifetime, but that is not the message that the leadership industry sends. So I have extensive critiques about the leadership industry, which, however, is not the focus of this conversation. Not the leadership industry. That's another conversation. We can have another time over a beer, preferably. So what's the problem? The problem, very, very, very simply, is this. I'm going to, again, just we don't have to go over that in detail. So the leadership industry over the last 30, 40 years has grown exponentially. So this is like, like a primitive graph. OK, so that's the upward axis. At the same time, however, what has happened to our perceptions of leaders, our feelings of le about leaders, our trust in leaders, by every measure, every single leader. I'm not just talking about political leaders. I'm not just talking about Congress. We all know Congress. It's so easy to pick on Congress. I'm talking about every kind of leader, educational leaders, religious leaders, military leaders. By the way, this is a global phenomenon. I wish we had time to talk about the world, which we don't particularly. But my point is that you have these cur this curious intersection, just as this big money is being spent simultaneous to that over the last 30, 40 years, you have a problem with leadership. Everybody has gripes and complaints about leaders. And this conversation will be a little bit of an attempt to explain why, what is going on. By the way, leader attribution error, the error we all make, which is to attribute what goes right or what goes wrong to individual leaders, is, as its name implies, a mistake. And it is more of a mistake in the 21st century than it has ever been before. Because leadership, like everything else, changes. And that's a little bit of what I'm going to be talking about. Now, before I begin a little bit more substantive, and I know I said I'm going to talk fast, you saw the, uh, I said I never go backwards on these PowerPoints. I'm going backwards. A system, not a person. The fixation in one of my, maybe my biggest problem with the leadership training that people receive is the extreme attention to the self. It is essentially a narcissistic and self-indulgent exercise, in my view, where a lot of people want to learn a lot about themselves, self-awareness, skill development. I need to experience this. I need to experience that. I need to learn how to mobilize. I need to learn how to communicate. I need to learn how to make decisions. But I'm arguing that is a simplistic approach to how the world works now, which, is a, which favors a systemic approach. And I'm going to give you just three parts, although I will touch on all three parts very quickly. One is the leader. Nothing that I say is meant to denigrate the importance of the leader. It is meant only to denigrate the fixation on the leader, the obsessiveness with the leader. When I was a kid in school, there was no such thing as leadership learning, which there is now, by the way, elementary school, high school, college. We would learn, for example, civics. Very different mindset. Are you learning how to be a leader, or are you learning civics? Very different. So the leader matters, but he or she is not all important. Second part of the system, it has three parts. My system, you can have whatever system you want. My system has three parts, one the leader, Two, what's the natural obverse in English of leader? 
followers. Barbara mentioned the follower briefly. She said there were a couple of dozen books. I've never found that many on followers or followership. I'll get to that word in a minute. It's a problematic word, but I use it nevertheless. And the third part of the system is the context or contexts within which leaders and followers necessarily operate. OK, so it's a system, not a person. So the leadership attribution error is just that, an error. OK, don't panic. Don't panic. Short history. Very short, I promise, I promise. Very short. So here's what I'm trying to convey to you. When I said leadership and change, again, the history of leadership in two minutes. Plato and Machiavelli focused, you heard before, philosopher king. Machiavelli, of course, wrote about the prince. What you have then originally was a world in which where leadership really was all important. Leadership was either typically divine or, or so, so to speak, divine, royal, or it was clergy. So these two guys, and Confucius and those early philosophers, thinkers, they wrote about single individuals, leaders. Now, believe it or not, the change took place. I'm talking mainly about Western thinking here. The change took place as early as the early part of the Enlightenment. Now, if we had more time, I would love to test you and embarrass you, humiliate you, but we don't. Now, how many of you remember a book called The Leviathan? You were all forced. We were all forced to read it, or small parts of it, in school, many of us anyway. So The Leviathan, the reason I have Hobbes up there, he's the first to give a right to something other than the leader, although the Leviathan is the state. Now, what did he, anybody want to take a quick guess? What did he give some, us all the right to? What did we have the right to with Thomas Hobbes? Anybody? You are smarter than you look, you guys. Yes, exactly. The right to life. That was a big deal. And Thomas Hobbes said that unless the state, the Leviathan, guaranteed us the right to life, made sure, because he, of course, said life was nasty, brutish, and short, unless the state took care of us that way, protected us from these nastinesses, we had a right to overthrow the state. Very, very big deal. Thus begins, certainly in Western history, gradually the transition from all leaders all the time to, guess what? We, too, have a voice. So John Locke, whose ideas, of course, found that formed the basis of the American uh, Constitution, the American, the American Republic, what he did was talk about fractured government, divided government, checks and balances. What is implicit in the phrase checks and balances? Anybody? Somebody, something about power. Whoever said the word, what about power? Got to be checked, because if it isn't checked, what's going to happen? People are going to grab it. People are going to steal it. Don't forget, this was a revolutionary mentality, a revolutionary mentality. You could no longer have a single executive. You had to share power. You had to check power, because human beings were not to be trusted. This was a fundamental a reflection of a conception of human nature and leadership and followership. We're moving on to Marx and Stanton. Would you believe that the commune, I know none of you have ever read the Communist Manifesto. When I'm speaking to audiences in, your, in Europe, everybody's read the Communist Manifesto. When I'm in the United States, people say, no, I, I've never read it. Well, it's a great little pamphlet, especially if you want to make a revolution, although not as good as Lenin's writings on making a revolution. Uh, so the last lines of Karl Marx's and Friedrich Engels' Communist Manifesto, anybody know those? OK, it's an American audience. OK, it's all right. Yeah, I hear, I hear a few people. Oh, God. Where, where were you born, sir? <laughs> Workers of the world, unite. You have nothing to lose but your chains. 
the book came out, or the pamphlet Communist Manifesto came out in 1848, the same year as Elizabeth Cady Stanton's Declaration of Sentiments. I don't know how many of you have ever read it or how many of you know it. It is essentially a furious treatise written by women against men. Bottom line, short version, you gradually had in the 19th century increasing follower power, increasing power from the bottom up. Leaders were becoming increasingly weakened as followers were becoming increasingly emboldened. Am I talking too fast? Are you guys? You're here. You're just like a fast liberal arts undergraduate course. Martin Luther King, one of the greatest things he ever wrote, I think it's maybe the greatest thing, by the way, a document full of rage, he's thought to be the black moderate, Martin, uh, Malcolm X is thought to be the extremist, try reading Letter from Birmingham Jail again, that is one angry document, came out also, I mentioned this t uh, time thing because it's very important, we think of globalization now, there's been globalization forever, 1963, Letter from Birmingham Jail, Betty Friedan, 1963, the book, Feminine Mystique. By the way, she was a piece of work, the genius, the genius of creating yet another feminist revolution based on a problem that has no name. Imagine a revolution on a problem, based on a problem you can't even identify. Again, a great conversation. Nelson Mandela's greatest, greatest, greatest speech ever. You should all read it at some point. 1964, made from a courthouse in uh, South Africa just before he was sent away for 27 years, as you all know. He ends this, the speeches about him trying to justify and explain, again, rising follower power, rising follower power, how he started as a disciple of Gandhi, in other words, nonviolence, and ended up going over to the ANC, a violent organization, and he, the last lines of this great, very long speech, I might add, are, I am prepared to die. I am prepared to die for my cause. So the last bullet point here, the world of 60s made. What I'm trying to get to, and will get to very, very quickly, is to explain why we are where we are, and this morning's conversation, which I was privileged to listen to, was a vivid example. The whole conversation was much less about leadership and leader this and leader that than it was about getting leader-like types, leaders and managers, to listen to the other. And what I'm trying to show you is that this is a historical trajectory so we have the world, the 60s made, incredible changes, not only the civil rights and the free speech and the women's rights movement, but lots of different movements. The gay rights movement, some of you may remember Stonewall in 1969. The animal liberation movement, the animal rights movement, 1975, a book by Peter Singer called Animal Liberation, and so forth and so on. By the way, speaking of from the bottom up, it, this extends to animals, and I don't mean to make light of it. I am sh trying to show how the world has changed enormously. Now, um, so here we are now. I mean, again, I feel like I'm rushing you too much. The End of Leadership, which is a book that Barbara referred to a few moments ago, tried to explain why the 21st century is yet again exponentially different. It's building on but it's different from what came before. Now, why? Very, very quickly, two reasons. I'm just checking my watch here, because that is not something I can count. OK, why? The two reasons, as I said, they're number one, culture, changes in the culture, and number two, changes in technology. Now, I won't say anything about changes in technology because they seem to me so self-evident that a world in which everybody can tweet or blog anonymously hideous things about leaders, uh, and leaders have no way of responding, among other things, these things, as I said, are anonymous. If, that, if it isn't clear to you that technology and shared information and all of that uh, 
has made a huge difference in the changing relationship between leaders and followers, uh, then I hope after this conversation it will be. I want to say a word about the changes in culture, which may be a little bit less obvious. And to make it also as economical as I can, maybe I will simply limit my comments on that to two words. The first word is Monica, and the second word is Lewinsky. So what do I mean by that? You can call it if you want. I have a lot of slang terms like the American idolization of American life, which means everybody can has their say. You know, we used to go to a restaurant, you would buy a book written by an expert. Now you go to Yelp or whatever. In other words, everybody's an expert on everything. The importance of authority has been incredibly demeaned. But what has simultaneously happened, and I, you know, for those of you who were around in 1998, the degree to which Bill Clinton, who of course triumphed over his humiliation, we don't have to go into it, but it was unbelievably embarrassing and humiliating. The level of intrusion, our sense of entitlement, the ordinary, I'm entitled to know which way the president's penis hung. Sorry, this was in the New York Times. If you think I'm being crass, I'm not. That's what was going on in 1998. The level of detail that we had about that particular relationship, even in retrospect, is mind-boggling. Now, what does that do? It shrinks the distance between this person and this person. So you have two things working together, changes in culture, changes in technology, and as I said before, you had only to be witness to this morning's conversation in this very room to understand this incredible emphasis now on the follower or the constituent or the customer or the client. You can have whatever euphemism you want on hearing, listening, I think that verb came up a lot this morning, on listening. It's no longer about me telling you what to do, it's about me going, okay, what do you really want and need? And that is a huge, huge sea change. It is the end of leadership. Uh, I'm not gonna, those of you who wanna know about my intellectual trajectory, you can ask me after the, if you're dying to hear. Uh, but it actually started with a book called Bad Leadership which I realized for the first time, you know, uh, there's always a literature on followers as well as leaders. What I realized in bad leadership is you cannot have bad leadership without bad. It just doesn't exist. And I thought, why is nobody writing about this? So I did write a book called Followership, and out of that came the other stuff. Now, I'm going to go very, very quickly through this because I simply don't have enough time to go into it carefully. In a book called Followership, I divide, that's my, that's my struggle with the word follower. I mean, as we said a moment ago, in English, follower is the natural obverse of leader. It's the other. So you don't have to use the word follower, but I like it simply because it makes sense in English, so I'm sticking with it. But I sometimes simply say the other, but here is my definition of the word follower. Notice two things about it. There is nothing that is sheep-like or weak about the way I define the word, and nor the way I define the word, and this is again a problem with the English language, the way I use the word, followers don't necessarily always follow. There's a, there is a good book on followership, in addition to mine, by a guy named Ira Chalif called The Courageous Follower, which is about followers who don't always follow. Guess what? We want resistance if it's a good thing. So I ha have come up myself with different types of followers. There is a lot of learning to be done. You know, when people talk to me about the deficiencies of the American government, I will often say to them, especially about Congress, this is not a crisis of leadership. It is a crisis of followership because people are unwilling, certainly in Congress, to go along. I'll follow you if you follow me the next time. It's a part of the deal. We don't teach good followership, we don't teach good civics, we teach leadership. We teach lots and lots and lots of chiefs, we don't p teach people how to be good Indians. And guess what? You can't have a world made up only of chiefs. You just can't. So the way to teach this stuff is much, much more nuanced than the leadership industry would generally suggest. 
So there are guides to badness and goodness. You know, it's a whole interesting subject, what makes a good leader, what makes a good follower, which this can only hint at. My most recent interest is in context, as I think Barbara mentioned. You cannot understand. I think, uh, Phil, you've written about this. Excuse me, I know about your work. Uh, <laughs> Phil has actually written about this. <laughs> Phil has actually written about this in one of his essays. He said, he made a comment on how CEOs in, in your world, in the, in the world of philanthropy, were struggling. Leaders were struggling much more than they used to. Well, they're struggling not only, the, 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 the last book I wrote is called Hard Times Leadership in America, because all leaders are struggling. You guys are struggling, but so, as you know, as I said earlier, are leaders in every sector. And they're not struggling because they themselves are inadequate. It's because the world in which they are embedded has changed around them. And my basic argument for leadership education, we can talk about this later if you want, is that it needs to be much broader and more nuanced than simply the focus on the self. That leaders need to understand the context within which they're embedded as much as they need to understand this themselves. So uh, very quickly, these are some of the components of context that I look at in hard times. These are some of the running themes, which are going to run because they're not going to be up there very long. What I'm going to do, because I think I'm almost sorry, guys. You'll have to, I'll have to leave you. You know how they always say in entertainment, always leave them hungry. I'm going to leave you very hungry. Uh, but I am going to end. Now, I'm sorry I'm not going to be here this evening. Because I think this e what I'm saying I think is going to resonate with your speaker this Thanks. evening. I'm going to end by being self-indulgent. I'm an inveterate uh, and tireless blogger. And I blogged about what I call the leadership system in the wake of Baltimore. And I'm going to read you just this one blog. That will be my last comment, and then we'll have a conversation. So if you will uh, give me just a few more minutes to read this single blog. It's called Learning Baltimore. Leadership types look at life through the lens of the leader. It is the leader who is said to create change. It is the leader who is said to control the action. It is the leader who is said to be the agent of historical causation. How flimsy is this as an explanation for how history happens has been evident again in Baltimore, as it was in Ferguson, the site of the first in a recent series of violent protests against the persistence of racial injustice. Dissecting these outbreaks in the usual ways by pointing to leaders is clearly wholly and woefully inadequate. Who has been a leader in Baltimore? The mayor? the police commissioner, the state's attorney for Baltimore City, the various legislators who sought to intervene. Sure, they're the ones in positions of authority. But they, have they been, in any obvious way, leaders? Have they been, in any consistent way, able to frame the situation to enlist followers? For that matter, what about the followers? those without any obvious sources of power, authority, and influence. Have they been the ones controlling the action? Has this been a case of power to the people, power to the powerless? Have usual followers morphed into unusual leaders? In fact, they have, but likely only temporarily. Those who control the streets do, for a time, control the action. Others respond to what they do. But their moment in the sun is usually, not always, but usually brief. More often than not, when the protesters have gone home, the situation reverts back to what it was. Baltimore in the 1960s and early 70s was, in fact, a hotbed of racial unrest. And in response were, in fact, numberless government programs and private-public partnerships intended to create positive change. But in time, over time, it became clear that the changes were inadequate to the task at hand. The task was so enormous because the change that was required was systemic. It was not about a single individual or a single institution. It was not about developing good leaders or about enlisting good followers. 
It was, it is about coming to comprehend that broken parts comprise a broken whole and that enduring change requires that the whole, the system, be fixed. Loss of jobs, abandoned homes, high rate of poverty, high rate of single parent families, high rate of high school dropouts, high rate of crime, high rate of infant mortality, low rate of life expectancy, predatory banks, mass incarceration, limited access to decent housing, all these issues and then some have a disparate and disproportionate impact on non-white racial groups, particularly African Americans. What's the lesson to be learned by the leadership industry particularly? There are two. The first is that because these broken parts are integral to the broken whole, they all need repair. It will not suffice to tackle only education or only health or only housing. The second is that system systemic repair is not amenable, not amenable to leadership as we conventionally preach and practice it. It is not that the problems are irremediable, immune to human intervention. Rather, it is that in order to fix them, we need to develop in our leaders a depth of contextual intelligence and expertise that far exceeds that which we typically think of as leadership development. What we are talking about here is educating for leadership in ways that are much more extensive and demanding than those that are, that, uh, than those that are conventionally conceived. We are talking, what we are talking about here is learning Baltimore and learning America. This will require not only acquiring skills, but information and insight into how the system has worked historically and into how it works now, politically, economically, and socially.